Okay, I'll try not to walk around. Do I need the microphone? Good, okay. Um, so what I thought I would do is, is talk a little bit, I don't have slides, but what I thought I would do is talk a little bit about um, some of the projects I've been involved with and, and talk a little bit about where some of the ethical issues that have come up in some of my collaborations and then raise with a, probably a fairly hefty dose of personal opinion what I think are some of the biggest challenges that I see for conducting research here at the, uh, for conducting international collaborations here at the university, which certainly include research, but, but I think include training as well, and, and then conclude with some of my own thoughts, and, and perhaps where we need to be moving as a university to, to perhaps address some of the gaps, and would be really curious to hear what other people's opinions are as well. So, as, as Melissa said, my work has primarily been international. I've been working on the HIV area, uh, for 35 years and have been working internationally, primarily in Africa, uh, on HIV for the last 30 years or so. Um, and I thought I would talk about one of my current projects and then list what are some of the ethical issues that have come up and what I think have been some of the lessons learned that, that certainly have, have been useful to me over the years. So, um, my work, uh, the project I'll talk about today involves community support workers in Ethiopia. And for those of you who want to get involved in um, international work, I have to say that um, the way this project developed, and, and this really, I think, is, is one of the, it is, is most, it's often very difficult to get funding in international research. And so we were very fortunate to get a, a grant, a pilot grant from the GPS Alliance to get our, ourselves going. Um, and I'll tell you about the results of that pilot grant. Um, based on that, we were able to apply for an exploratory R21 developmental grant, uh, and we have currently, uh, I think, have a very high likelihood of receiving a large five-year R01, uh, which will allow us to continue this work. And so, a lot of times when you want to work internationally, just kind of getting your foot in the door is often the most difficult thing, and so I think the resources from GPS Alliance, uh, AHC has seed grants, depending on what uh, program you're in, are often really good just to to kind of get yourself going. So, in a few minutes, our, our project uh, worked with community support workers, and, and this was in rural Ethiopia. And the problem that um, was brought to us by the Ministry of Health and the local regional health officers was that um, they were doing a lot of testing for HIV, but what was happening was that people were enrolling in care, and that that's great, but within the first year, like 25% of those people were no longer in care. They were dropping out, they weren't coming into the clinic, some of them were dying at home, um, um, they were going off of their medications, which uh, meant that there was a risk of them transmitting HIV to other people. When they were coming back to the clinic, they were often at death stores, and so the question was, how can we keep people engaged in, in, in care? So what we did is we um, developed a project um, where we used community support workers who were also people living with HIV, they were recruited from the community themselves, and basically anybody who was a newly diagnosed HIV patient was assigned a community support worker who was from the same village. Um, and so we trained them, uh, we had supportive supervision, and basically the community support workers would meet with their clients initially once a week, and then it sort of spaced out a little longer, and they provided education about HIV, they provided social support, and so they would do things like, oh, I know it's really tough to take your medicine, but you know what? I have to take my medicine. Why don't we, co I'll come over for tea and we'll do, we'll take our medicines together. Um, they provided, they talked to them about disclosure. People did sometimes were positive and didn't even want to tell their wife or their husband. Uh, and so they worked with them on that. Um, we were able to provide referrals. And also, we gave them a cell phone. And so in the past, what would happen is sometimes people would get a rash, they'd get nauseated from the medicine. Um, they would stop taking their medicine and stop coming to the clinic. Well, this way, what could happen is they could call up uh, with the community support worker, the, um, the uh, nurse at the clinic, they could discuss the person's situation, the nurse could make some recommendations for how they could manage it. If it looked like it was something serious, um, they could um, uh, arrange for the person to be seen right away in the clinic. And to make a long story short, uh, out of 142 patients that we had through this pilot study. Um, early on, we found this is very typical, sadly, uh, in Africa, uh, where like seven, over the first year, seven of the 
clients had died. These were typically people with uh, very late stage AIDS that appeared first time for care. Three of them transferred out, and our loss to follow-up over the first year was zero, uh, which was which was fairly remarkable um, in terms of what was being seen um, in the rest of the uh, of the healthcare setting. So we basically felt that this was a, was successful, and again, we're sort of building on that with our future projects. And so one of the questions, I guess, are what are some of the lessons learned that we've gotten from, from our experience? Uh, and, and I would sort of say four of them um, really come to mind. The first, and this will uh, probably uh, repeat a lot of what Melissa said, but they really are, are important. The first is you, you can't overestimate the importance of these collaborative partnerships. And so when we start going into a new area, you spend a lot of time just hanging out. You know, it's not really hanging out. But you spend a lot of time just talking to people. So we met with, you know, the local pe uh, people living with AIDS associations. We went to the hospitals. We went to the, you know, health departments. We um, just talk we talked to village leaders, and you just spend a lot of time just hanging out and talking to people and finding out what are their concerns and 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 and, and what are the issues that come up. Um, and um, when we have our local partners, we involve them in all stages. And, you know, many times you say, oh, this is how we thought we would set up things. And they go, no, that's not going to work. You know, that doesn't work here. The way you get things done here is this way. You know, uh, Melissa talked about dealing with the infrastructure and the bureaucracy. Um, thank God we have some really great people who are able, for example, to help us negotiate the Ethiopian purchasing and, and regulation system. And, uh, you know, um, they are really skilled at it. And they know people and they knew who were the right people to go to. So, you know, really substantively involving your local partners for all kinds of reasons um, is, is extraordinarily important. Uh, in our surveys, we ask about fairly personal things, like we ask about sex, we ask, ask, ask about drugs. Um, and again, how you do those in sort of a culturally sensitive way is really important, and your local partners are great at helping you do all that. So that really can't be uh, overestimated. As I'll talk about in a second, you're also investing in, in your local people, and, and that's really important as well. The second is, you know, when we apply for our IRBs, and they always talk about the benefits and the risks, and when you think about benefits, there's a variety of different types of benefits. I think one thing that's extraordinarily important, and this, this sounds kind of silly, you know, is that you have to be asking a question that's scientifically valid and useful to the people there. Um, and, you know, um, sometimes you see people say, well, we're going to do this study here. And say, well, how is this going to benefit the people of Nicaragua? How is this going to benefit the people of India? Are just doing it because it's convenient? Um, and so, again, they can help you craft the question that is most useful and most relevant to the people there. Um, the second, which is really important, is, you know, you guys know a lot more than you think you know. Um, and so we really, when we go in to do research, have an awful lot to offer other people. And they are really sort of hungry um, for the knowledge that you have about how you set up a research study, how you um, set up a data collection system, how you analyze data, how you do whatever whatever is the data collection. And so if you look at some of the really successful projects um, that have uh, worked in other countries, they have really invested in that infrastructure. Um, and certainly the human infrastructure can't be uh, uh, overestimated. Also, things like, you know, if you, you know, we, some of the projects we work in, you know, we, we'll bring in lab equipment if that's needed. You know, we'll bring in uh, computers, we'll bring in those types of things. And again, in particularly in resource limited settings, by sort of developing the infrastructure, I think that, you know, we're really helping to promote uh, them being able to do more work at, at, at their end, and, and, and I think that's really important. Um, there's a phrase that I hadn't heard until I got into this, which is called colonial research. Uh, colonial research is where um, basically somebody goes into another country, you know, you get your data, you go back, you publish it, you say thank you very much, um, and you really don't have any involvement of your local investigators as well. That's not that helpful, and it doesn't make for good relations. Um, and so really allowing your local investigators to be trained and to present the results, to be on the papers, to be lead investigators, um, the results of that, that can't be, um, really can't be uh, uh, overlooked. And then the final result of that is, you know, when you find something, like when we've done our work, like for example, it's really important upon us 
to go back and make sure that we have presented it. So for example, with the project that I told you about earlier, we went back, we had a seminar uh, that uh, was sponsored by the Regional Ministry of Health, and we brought everybody together, and this was part of our project and presented the results to people there. And there was a discussion about how could the Ministry of Health or how could the local health department move forward based on what we had found and, and make it a more sustainable project. So I think that's the second issue, I would say, is really thinking about benefits. The third one is, uh, Melissa touched on this issue of vulnerable populations. And this is a tough one. I mean, by and large, if you're working internationally, often you are working with people who have a whole lot less than you do. Um, and so, um, they may be poor, they may be marginalized for all kinds of reasons. And so one of the things that we've had, so for example, in our projects where we do surveys, we will often give people a stipend, uh, which is for transportation, for their time and effort to, let's say, come to the clinic to take the survey. We've had these long discussions about what is the appropriate stipend. Um, and, you know, if you imagine that if you're doing something which has a very high risk, and you're giving people a lot of money, people may take that risk because they need the money. But then the question is, when you're working with vulnerable populations, when does sort of a reimbursement or an incentive become um, exploitative, I guess, you know? Uh, and you are asking people to take risks that they would not normally take uh, because they need the money. And, and so that's just sort of one example of working with vulnerable populations. Minimizing the risk, Melissa gave a couple examples, and I totally echo those, about the issue of confidentiality around HIV. It's a huge issue. Um, there's a huge amount of stigma related to HIV. Um, many of the other diseases, um, let's say you're doing a project on, hypothetically, Ebola, um, and some stigma associated with that. And so how you deal with vulnerable populations and protection of confidentiality and other arms is, is a huge issue, and it's it's, again, you may think you know what the risks are, but your local folks will tell you what's really going on, and, and, and that's enormously important. And the fourth issue is the issue of informed consent. Um, all of our projects and our IRB requires, by the way, we, we have a fantastic IRB, and I just want to give a shout out to them. Um, and, you know, really, they are, where I found them to be extraordinarily helpful, it is, um, Often, if you're not sure which way to go on something, rather than just submitting it, a very helpful thing is, is you know, talk to your IRB, consult with them. They're terrific. They have an incredible amount of knowledge, and often they can help you, before your application goes in, anticipate what a lot of the issues are going to be. And, and they, they're nothing but completely supportive, I, I would say. But, you know, um, the issue with informed consent is, you know, that, well, okay, so you got this document and it says, you know, all these things, the university may compensate you based on injury, based on a number of factors and all these other, and so somebody signs it. And there have been a number of studies where people have actually gone back and they say to people, okay, well, you've signed this, and they say, D can, you, can you quit the study if you want? And they go, no, you know. Um, and so just signing the piece of paper um, doesn't necessarily mean that uh, you can have informed consent. Um, uh, many of the people in our study can't read, so that, that's a challenge, you know. And so what we do is we give our informed consent verbally, and each place is different. Um, and then at the end, and a number of uh, um, uh, protocols will do this, we sort of ask some questions of people. We said, well, what are you going to be asked to do? Uh, can you change your mind and quit? Uh, you know, what are some of the risks of participating in this study? And so often that really becomes more of a, rather than just sort of, you know, kind of mindlessly reading this form and saying, do you understand and sign it, is really engaging. Consent really becomes a process. And we train people uh, and do practices about, uh, about getting consent as well. So there's a lot of other issues, but those are at least four, I would say, that have certainly uh, come up uh, in, in my experience. Um, since I was asked to sort of think about ethics, uh, I thought, well, now I'll just you know, throw out some other things. And we've actually had some conversations about this, I know with Meredith and the, the GPS Alliance, and so share some of these with the group to think about. As we develop international collaborations, be they research or be they training, uh, or they be they, you know, some other type of, of engagement, um, what are some of the issues that, that are particularly going to be devilous? Um, and I, I, I wanted to pick at least three. 
The first is, should they be able to determine the content of who is involved or who comes? So for example, I've been told that uh, there may be a country on the Arabian Peninsula which um, has some stipulations in terms of who can come, let's say, perhaps as a trainer, uh, or perhaps by gender, uh, or by religion, okay? Uh, so if you're a woman, you know, they may not want you to come to do training, and, and is that an issue? The second is, um, there may be restrictive policies in that country that affect either the program content or the staff, and I'll give you an example of that. As you probably know, there are a number of countries, and I'll pick two of them, uh, Uganda and Niger uh, Nigeria, which have passed anti-gay legislation. And so, for example, the, the anti-gay legislation in Uganda says it's an offense, the offense of homosexuality is what they call it, results in life imprisonment. Now, that was struck down by the court, but there's a very good chance that something along those lines may be coming back again. In Nigeria, directly or indirectly making a public show of same-sex relations can lead to 10 years of imprisonment. And so the question is, you know, either if we have staff, you know, who are part of our local project, or staff, like, coming over uh, who are gay, is that going to put them in harm's way? Um, is it going to impact, let's say, if we're doing a study on HIV prevention? the kind of things that we can say or the kind of things that we cannot say, and should we be engaged in a country or a context that has those kind of policies. And I'll present some of the pro and con arguments that I've heard, but I think the one thing that we can't not be doing is having the discussion and ask, asking the questions. The third is, you know, what if we are working in countries where government policies result in harm or discrimination or physical violence to some disadvantaged population? And an uh, example of that, and these are all examples of where people have been exploring collaborations in Myanmar. Um, and as you know, um, there is a long history of uh, repression of uh, one of the ethnic minorities uh, in that country, uh, where in some cases there have been reports of people being denied citizenship, subject to systematic violence, uh, state-sponsored forced labor, torture, sexual violence, those kind of things. And so the question is, do we really have at the university level, you know, some sort of policies or, or, or guidelines? And so, for example, um, the Karolinska Institute uh, has some ethical guidelines for international collaboration, and I won't read them all, but they say the selection of persons for student and doctoral exchange programs must be based on qualifications of the individual regardless of age, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, disability, political views, religion, or nationality. Um, should we be having something like that at our level um, uh, to uh, move the uh, um, uh, discussion along? And should there be some sort of guidelines at the university level? And we've sort of been exploring uh, with the GPS Alliance and, and other colleagues what might be available and are there some needs um, at the university level. So as we've been talking about this, and I'll just sort of throw this, really throw this out for discussion, there's a couple of answers that I've heard, and, and I have more sympathy for some than others, but I think it, it really sort of shows the complexity of these things. One is, well, that's the IRB's job. Um, and I, what I would say to that is, you know, our IRB is fantastic. I think they do a phenomenal job of looking at the um, research ethics of a proposal that you're identifying. As Melissa was saying, often what you put on your application, when you get into the reality of the country, there may be some issues that that uh, may not always be reflected or anticipated uh, in your um, um, proposal. But also, you know, I, I, there are sort of more fundamental issues as we've talked about that may not be reflected in the specifics of a specific application. Um, the second argument I've heard is, uh, for lack of a better word, sort of called ethical relativism. Well, we do it too, you know. And, and again, I, I, that's not one that I'm totally sympathetic to because it seems like there are certain things that are a little, perhaps a little bit beyond the pale uh, where, where we might have some concerns. Um, the third argument I've heard is, well, it's financially beneficial. Um, and again, I, it's not one that I have total sympathy for. Um, I understand that particularly in these uh, financially tough times, uh, we do need to su support our training and research programs. but. Uh, if it puts you in a situation where you're really sort of violating some core fundamental uh, concepts or, or guidelines, it, it causes um, some challenges. Um, the fourth one is um, cultural sensitivity. I think this is important. You know, they say we need to be sensitive to local norms and, and 
uh, attitudes, and there's, certainly there are things that I would not say, for example, if I'm doing a training in Africa, in the same way that I might say it to a student group here. Um, but again, where you draw the line on that, um, are you censoring yourself or are you trying to be culturally appropriate, um, I think is, 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 is a tough issue. Um, the fifth one I heard is they say, well, we can have a positive impact, um, and it's better to be inside the tent than outside. And I, I have to, again, have some sympathy for that. I think it's a good argument that by being engaged, perhaps we can have a positive contribution. And the sixth one is that, well, the people that we're working with are not the problem. You know, the problem is the government policy, but the people we're working with, and again, this is true, um, are the academics, the people who perhaps are more broad-minded, the people who really aren't involved in some of the policies that we might find more objectionable. So I think these are very sort of muddy and tricky waters, and, and again, my own feeling uh, is that probably the only thing that would be a mistake in this case is, is to not have a discussion. So I, I think that you know we do need to be having the discussion. These are all challenging issues, but um, um, definitely, I think, uh, in the world that we live in, um, they're out there. Um, and, and so I think we, we need to be thinking about that. So um, those are a few reflections and thoughts, and I guess we have open to yeah. We have time for